Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Or what is left of her, considering the pickings over. We have a wedding up in the mountains. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is uh, Nate Thompson. I'm one of pastors here at Southside. Our main preaching pastor, Ken, has been struggling with uh, sickness. So please keep him in your prayers, if you would. And I'd like to welcome any guests who are here with us for the first time. Thank you for coming and worshiping our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning together. So if you would, uh, pray with me as we open. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new day and the mercies that you give to us that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We uh, pray that you would be with us in our time in the Word. We pray that you are put on display, that you are honored, and that those who don't know you would come to know you. Those who do would be encouraged in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When he was 88 years old, the late Supreme Court Justice, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, once found himself on a train. And when the conductor came by, Justice Holmes couldn't find his ticket. And he seemed terribly upset. He searched all his pockets and fumbled through his wallet without success. The conductor was sympathetic. <clears throat> he said, don't worry, Mr. Holmes. The Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to trust you. After you reach your destination, you'll probably find the ticket. And you can just mail it to us. But the conductor's kindness failed to put Mr. Holmes at ease. Still very much upset, he said, my dear man, my problem is not where is my ticket. The problem is where am I going? <laughs> and at 88 years old, you can figure out why. So an important thing that, right? Where am I going? And, and where Am I going indeed has very much to do with goals, and if I don't have one, it's easy to get lost, and if I don't have one, it's easy to realize that I am lost, right? So that, that has to do with the passage that we are going to be looking at this morning. So if you would turn in your Bibles to the first epistle of Timothy, so 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to focus in on verses 3 through 7 this morning. So our outline is going to be really simple um, as we get to this passage. Um, our first point will be location. Where does Paul want Timothy? That's going to be verse 3a. It's, uh, our next one is going to be uh, order. What is, Paul, uh, what is it that Paul wants Timothy to do? That'll be verses 3b to 4. Um, and then uh, our third point will be virtue. What is it that Paul wants Timothy to teach himself and others? That's verse 5. And then lastly, error. What error does Paul see that Timothy needs to be aware of in this? So before we step into our passage, um, let's just set the background. And, and fortunate for us, we're starting in verse 3, so we don't have a lot of work to do. Um, just simple, simply understanding who wrote this Paul. Um, and he's writing it from Macedonia. He's writing it to Timothy, who appears to be in Ephesus. This is probably uh, his, uh, after his release from his first imprisonment. Paul's about 63, 64 uh, AD is when he wrote it. And he, he just has his introduction. His introduction is who he is. He's an apostle. And by uh, or according to the commandment of God. And, uh, and then to Timothy, my true child in the faith. So you can see a bond there. And so that quickly gets us right into our text, just to make the groundwork very simple. And that gets us to verse 3 and our first point. First point, point is location. Where does Paul want Timothy? Right? So verse 3 says, As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus. Remain on in Ephesus. So... He's uh, imploring, and this is the uh, probably all too familiar Greek word parakaleo, to come alongside, to encourage, um, to, to plead. And that's what he's doing with, with Timothy. He's saying, please, I want you to stay 
in Ephesus. I want you to stay here at this church, and, uh, and then he's going to get into why here in a minute. Um, and, uh, and there's multiple reasons why he could be pleading and uh, encouraging, uh, what have you. Um, one uh, most commentators gravitate towards is that Timothy could be timid Timothy and is fearful. And uh, why not? I mean, we've, if you have read the first epistle, uh, he has to deal with the likes of teachers who are in error like Hymenius and Alexander, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Um, there are issues with women overstepping their roles. He has to deal with that, chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Elders and deacons who need to be reminded of their roles, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Apostates that need to be rejected, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Widows that need to be addressed, chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. And elders and deacons who possibly need to be called out in front of the whole church, chapter 5, verses 17 to 25, just to name a few. There's a lot on his plate. And why wouldn't that be intimidating? So it is possible that he is intimidated by all that he needs to do. So another possibility, though, is, um, and, and those of you who have been in the ministry or, or served in some capacity can um, associate with just people are difficult. People are hard to work with. It's exhausting. Um, not everybody's your buddy, and not, not everybody's out for your good. Um, it's hard in the ministry, and so it could be that he just needs to be encouraged because he's looking at the task before him, and he's just tired. He's just tired. So another possibility is that uh, if we look at, it, at the introduction, there's an intense love between Paul and Timothy. They love each other. And, and it, is it hard to leave someone you love? And I, and I want us to even reflect on, is it hard to leave someone that you love in the faith? Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of traveling to, um, to Spain, to Mexico, to North Africa, to visit people who I love in the faith. And, and the hardest part of the trip is having to go. It's having to leave the ones that you love. And so it could be that Timothy needs to be encouraged uh, because he says, Paul, I, I want to be with you. I want to go with you. I want to be with you. And Paul just needs to say, no, you need to stay. You need to stay. I know. So another possibility is that it's some combination of all three of those, right? You can see Timothy in an honest conversation with Paul on the road to Macedonia and walking along modern-day Turkey. And I'm a little scared. I'm a little worn out. I'm a little sad. Paul when I think about going back to Ephesus and Paul being a mature believer, encouraging him in all of these things and saying, it's okay, it's okay. So that's, that's why he needs the encouragement. He needs to be encouraged because something's going on there. And then, then why? That brings us to our second point. Our second point, order. What is it that Paul wants Timothy to do? That gets us back into starting the second half of the verse, chapter three, uh, verse three. So that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculations rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So he gives him a, a hint of clause, a so that. Uh, purpose statement, and he says, tells Timothy, I want you to uh, instruct, uh, it says, says my translation, but uh, you might have a different word, and, and the word there uh, means actually to command, right? Timothy was to command these men to stop it, stop it, stop what they were teaching. And what were they teaching? Well, it says men not to teach and strange doctrines. And that whole uh, thought there, not, not to teach strange doctrines, that whole phrase, that's just one Greek word. And, and some even think that uh, Paul himself was the guy who, who invented this, this word, um, hetero didaskaleo, all right? You're probably familiar with the, the phrase hetero, right? 
hetero is di uh, different, of different kind, right? So it's different than something. And then dadaskaleo, you probably heard from the pulpit dadasko or dadaskalos, uh, to teach, and usually to teach authoritatively. So he, what he's saying is whatever it is that they're teaching is contrary to the teaching of the apostles. So if I take into account Galatians 1, 8, and 9, where Paul says, if anyone teaches a gospel different than the gospel that we brought to you, let that man be accursed. And he reiterates it a second time, essentially saying the same thing in verse 9, uh, Galatians 1, 9. So there's a criticality to the gospel. So odds are what they're teaching is contrary to the gospel, either by subtraction or addition. Subtraction or addition. Oh, it doesn't need to be Jesus. That would be by subtraction. Or it needs to be Jesus plus something else. That would be addition. So there's something going on, and he, and he says, you command these men not to teach. And then there's also other things going on here in verse Four, nor to, nor to pay attention to myths and in endless genealogies. So myths, this is a, a Grecian culture, probably has to do with that. Genealogies probably has to do with um, uh, Jewish genealogies reaching far back. I'm associated with David, I'm associated with Solomon, I'm associated with Aaron or something like that. Some kind of connection that gives them credence, chest thumping, whatever it is. Um, we don't get the exact whys, j just that this is it. I mean, it reminds me of a uh, time I was uh, uh, 15, 16. I was backpacking up in the Wimanuchi Wilderness in Colorado, and I was on this trip with a group of guys, and I, was, I got to talking with this one young man, and we had so much in common and agreed so much theologically, and I was just enjoying the conversation. And then uh, we're, we're laying there and, uh, in the tent and, and talking, and... And he says, so what do you think of the Greek gods? I was like, the Greek gods? Um, I, I think it's all a bunch of garbage. He's like, well, I, I believe in all of them because, you know, Genesis 6. <laughs> it's like sons of God, daughters of men. It's like, ooh, this is going to be a long night. <laughs> um, so uh, myths, right? Myths, getting, getting in, talking to, talking about these myths. And, and what, what ultimately is the problem? It's a distraction. It's a distraction from what? Paul says what? From furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. It's, it's not kingdom focused. It's not gospel centered and it's not Christ centered. It's not love. It's not loving God, loving others. It's missing faith in Christ, faith in his finished work. It's, it's absent. It's absent, and so it's a distraction, and thus it's a problem. And, and we don't want to just say all he's concerned about is salvation with respect to justification, Be, which is critical, right? So I, I need justification to, in the salvific sense in, in being right with God. But it, it's also sanctification, all right? And that is that I am being saved, and glorification, I will be saved, these aspects of salvation too. So if you get, a, get someone saved, we don't say, we're done. No more work to be done. We're saved. Well, no, no. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring about its completion. No, it's, we're not done yet. We're not done. There's still more work to be done. And a distracted Christian is an ineffective Christian. Distracted by other things, myths, genealogies, some other something. Is a Christian not focused on Christ, not focused on the administration of what it is, what, what it's all about in Christ? Do you see how goals, having a focal point would matter? It's like if it doesn't matter, then eh, we're, we're good. No, it, this, this matters, this matters. So that steps us right up to the door of verse 5, which is, where I want to spend the majority of our time this morning. All right. And so our third point is virtue. What is it that Paul wants Timothy to teach himself and others? What is it that Paul wants Timothy to teach himself and others? So verse five says, but 
The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And this is one of those strawberry jam-packed verses full of, of meaning, full of purpose. Six nouns, three adjectives, three conjunctions, two definite articles, one critical prepositional phrase, and one teeny tiny verb. Now, why does that matter? If it was chocked full of verbs, that means it would be chocked full of action. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. But it's not. It's chock full of nouns, which is it's about this, it's about this, it's about this, it's about this. And, and you can tell Paul's heart in wanting to make sure that Timothy gets this right. He doesn't want to leave any wiggle room for what he's saying, right? So he starts out with, and, and we'll get the occasional chuckle from the elementary school boy, it's, it, it starts out with the but. That's how it starts, the but. It, it, in English, it's but the, okay? That's uh, the but, okay? The is that definite article, but's that, well, it's not what you think it is, but it's, it, it's the opposite, right? He's contrasting to something. He's contrasting to verses three and four. These men are teaching things contrary to Christ. These men are distracted. And he's saying, okay, but, not, not this, but we're gonna, there's something opposite. And the, that definite article, it's important that you understand what the is, okay? So what are these guys doing? They're studying and teaching. Well, how about us? But the, and then we get goal. Goal is that next word. And, and the Greek meaning is end or termination point. The goal, There's, there is a termination point, there's a goal, and then what are we talking about with respect to this goal? Of our instruction. But the goal of our instruction so that implies something. We better be getting instruction. If there's no instruction, then the whole thing already just falls apart. It collapses. So it assumes that there's instruction. And it says the goal of this instruction. So there's a termination point or a point to this instruction. So I'm studying, I'm learning, but there is a reason why. And, he's, and, and that's going to be huge as we continue through the verses 6 and 7 because it's going to, that'll contrast us to what he's going to draw out here. So this instruction, this, the goal, this termination point has to do with our instruction. And right in between that is your verb. And it's the teeny tiny, it's just uh, a me. It's the, the, or I me, which is just is is. Goal is. Goal is. Okay. So our goal in doing this, so he hasn't completed the thought yet, but it's important. It's important that the church have instruction, have doctrine, have the truth of his word, that we're in it, that we know it. And if I'm not, then I'm missing something, right? But here's, here's the thing. That's the instruction. It tells us right off the bat, the instruction itself is not the termination point. I don't learn to learn. I don't learn so I can learn more. And this is society today. We learn to know, to know more, to know more, to know more. No. That's not the goal of our instruction. Not the goal of our instruction. What is it? The goal of our instruction is, there's her verb, love. Well, there we go. So, so the termination point is love. Here's the thing, and, and again, we're gonna we get technical on this. It's agape, 
not agapo, or agapon, or agapao. Agapao, you know, why are you speaking Hawaiian? No, okay, it's Greek, and it is all Greek. Okay, agapao is the verb form of love. Agape is the noun form of, the, of love. So he's saying the goal of our instruction is love, not to love, not to do love, but love. Make sense? You probably lost a lot of people there. And there's a reason why it's a noun, not a verb. There's a reason why it's a noun, not a verb. He, he doesn't say our, our goal is to just be loving. It includes that, by the way. So don't check out on me on that and say, well, he's, he's not going the right direction. It encompasses Matthew 22, uh, 34 to 40, right? Christ is asked, what's the most important command in the law? And Christ, without a blinking, just says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and he says, and I'll, I'll tack on to that, the second most is love your neighbor as yourself. And I'll go further than that and tell you that all the law and the prophets, you can hang on these two. Wow. That's heavy. It's weighty. But here's the thing. 1 John 4, 8 and 1 John 4, 16 tell me that God is love. It's also who he is. The reason why I'm loving has to do with the lover in the first place. We love, why? Because he first loved us. That's right. I didn't love because I was a great guy. I didn't love him first. He loved me. He loved me. So it gets to this point with regard to love, yes, I am to be loving, and that's encapsulated in this. But it's about the lover and who he is and the reflection of him to others. So it comes from him, and it comes and it goes back to him. Now that sounds a lot like a verse, like for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Romans eleven thirty six. Ken will get there in five years. <laughs> so that's really, that's, that's what, what this instruction is moving or should be pointed towards is this love, love. So the goal of our instruction is love, but Paul doesn't stop there. These are some great truths, but Paul doesn't stop it, put it in park and say, there you go, Timothy. He wants to be crystal clear about what it is that he's fleshing out. And he is. So he, so he gets his next, this, like I said, critical, this one critical prepositional phrase, ek, out of, from, okay? So this love comes from something. It's not non-substantive. It's not just loosey-goosey. It's not just some emotion, or it's not what I think it should be, or what I make it. It's not emotionalism. It's concrete in something. Ek, out from. Out from what? He gives us three things, and he combines adjective nouns, adjective noun, adjective noun gives us three of them. Boom, boom, boom. And they're all critical. First one he gives. From a, out from, a pure heart. A pure heart. That's number one. A pure heart. Um, Matthew chapter 5 is the Beatitudes. And if you recall, one of the Beatitudes is, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. But then why? For they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And if you read through the Beatitudes, and I encourage you to uh, look up Ken's sermons as he walked through the Beatitudes, 
there's a building of a person coming to faith in that. Blessed, 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 blessed. And this is toward the end of the Beatitudes, and he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, who are the people? Who are the people that can see God? Well, according to Psalm 1, only those who are right with him, 100% righteous. The only person that could see God is a person that is 100% righteous before God. Now, that gets us right into one of the very foundational things concerning the gospel. Can you and I make ourselves ever in any way using any method right before an all-holy God? And the answer is no. So this brings us right to the foot of the cross because the only answer is found at the cross. The only way I can be right with a holy God is if that holy God gives me his righteousness. Sound a lot like another verse in 2 Corinthians 4? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Pure heart. So what is this love based in? A pure heart, a right standing with God. So who can, who can have this love? It's already setting the bars. It's setting the fences. It's drawing the lines. Only a believer. Only a believer, only one that has truly come to faith in Christ can take this instruction and aim it at love and that love's the right love. All right? Other people can take instruction and aim it at love what they determine as love. But he's being very specific about the love he's talking about. As if the word agape itself wasn't enough. It's pretty succinct, but he wants to be more succinct. Pure heart, that's the first one in the list. Second one he lists, good conscience. Here we are with a conscience again. For those of you who are in Sunday school, groan, more conscience stuff. Yes, good conscience is a part of it. Good conscience. But, and what are we talking about? We're talking about a good conscience. This is not a person who's sitting in a corner chanting to themselves, I am right with God, I am right with God, I am right with God to try and get themselves to believe that they're right with God while having a conscience that condemns them. This piece of it is critical. So it's declarative that I am right with God. When we're talking about justification, he declares me as right, but he does something to my conscience. 1 Peter 3, 21 says, corresponding to that, uh, context, context is salvation. Baptism now saves you. Well, there it is. Every Christian needs to be baptized, right? No, because you need to finish the verse, right? Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Oh, okay, so it's not the water. But an appeal to God for a exact phrase, good conscience, for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvifically, when Christ died, he, he, he died for me. I come to him by salvation, faith in him, his finished work on the cross. And, and what happens? Declared righteous. And he takes that conscience and he makes it right to say, you are now right with me. Now, does that mean we never feel guilty again? And for those of you who are in the class, no, because our consciences can still condemn us over issues pertaining to conscience and morality that we have bound our conscience to. And that's why we connect this with a 1 John 1, 9. And maybe this will make sense because it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And then get this, the next word, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's that cleansing? What's going on with the cleansing? It has to do with the conscience. As we are 
wrong with him, and we agree with him, you're right, I'm wrong. He cleanses our consciences. And by the way, folks, he's the only one that can do it. Your therapist can't. Your friend, as kind-hearted as they might be, can't do it. No one can cleanse the conscience other than God himself. He's the one that can do it. He's the one that can do it. Amazing. So a good conscience is a part of this love, that this love comes from pure heart, a good conscience, and then the third item that he mentions is a sincere faith. A sincere faith. Well, what makes a sincere faith? I really, really mean it. That's what makes a sincere faith. How do I make a person sincere? I can't. Only God can do this. Make for a sincere faith. Did, did you know that our word sincere comes from the Latin? Sincere. Okay, sin is, is uh, in Latin, without. Sire is wax, without wax. Lose everybody on that one? Without wax? I think you got wax up there. So here's the thing. In the Roman culture, pottery could be sold, and it would have a sign that said, sincere, without wax. Because what potters would do is if they would overcook and that pot cracked or in the, in the uh, cooking or forming or painting phase, it cracked somehow, they would fill it in. They would fill it in with wax. And so it was not a genuine piece of pottery. It was actually cracked. They were covering it up. They were hiding it. So how did a person truly know if, it, if this pot was sincere? You know what they do? They'd pick it up, and they'd hold it against the light of the sun. And the cracks would show. And they would say, yeah, you say, you say it's sincere. It's not. This is a wax pot. It's cracked. The ones that were genuine said sincere, and they picked up, held it to the light. No cracks. It was pure. It was sincere. So I, I hope you're tracking with me on that analogy there. I mean, that's all true. All of that is true historical fact. That's what happened. But that, that should get us to think about something. How do I know if my faith is sincere? We hold it up to the light, the light of the world. See, Christ is the one that would show us, am I sincere? Is this right? Is my heart right with you? And we're, we're told that if I am his, he's given us his spirit, and his spirit says, you're my child, and our heart cries, Abba. Father, you're my dad. Sincere, sincere. So this love is attached to something. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And, he, and before we step away from the verse into verses 6 and 7, I want us to make note of something. Think about the nouns. Heart, conscience, faith. Are these external things or internal things? Are they matters of the immaterial being of man, his, his spirit? Or are they matters of the external faculties of man? These are all internals, right? Heart is the culmination of the mind, emotions, and will. Conscience is that immaterial aspect, mine. And faith is, is something that is in our immaterial being. That's, that's truly trusting God. It's not just a uh, 
decision, right? It's not just a, um, yeah, I believe in God. He exists. It's not just a mental ascension. Faith is something deeper. And so since these are all internals, it's, it's not the externals that make them what they are. Okay, so if I track this verse, it says the goal of our instruction, that's, that's what I'm studying, that's what I'm taking in, that's what I'm learning, is love. So this is action and unto a person from a pure heart that has to do with salvation and the right standing with God, a good conscience, which is something that happens once and I am responsible for doing on an ongoing basis, and a sincere faith, a genuineness before God. It's not a game. All of these things together. Why am I doing it? Why am I reading it? Well, let's find out what the opposition was doing. Maybe that'll help. That brings us to our fourth point. Error. What error does Paul see that Timothy needs to be aware of in this? Okay, verse 6 says, For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Okay, for some men different group, not you, straying, coming away from, these things. So doesn't that beg the question, what are the these things, right? So I've got this reflective pronoun, so that, that means it's, it's pointing back to something. In, in Greek, this is in the feminine, okay? So we've got masculine and feminine pronouns in most, I think, all languages, and we match them up, right? If I say uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, and someone fell down, and someone broke their crown, and someone came tumbling after, that would be very ambiguous, right? Uh, if I say Jack and Jill went up the hill, uh, to fetch a pail of water, and he fell down and broke his crown, and she came tumbling after, the pronouns help point me to who is being talked about, right? That's what we're saying. So these pronouns, this pronoun here, the these, is in the feminine. So whatever it's pointing back to, guess what we're looking for? Feminine, right? Okay. Just want to see if you're awake. So we're looking for feminine in the previous statements. Goal, instruction, love, heart, faith. I'm looking for pronouns. I'm looking for nouns that are in the same gender. All right, so if I go through, well, you know what happens? Only one of them drops out. Only one of the nouns drops out. It's just goal. Goal drops out. Instruction, love, heart, uh, pure is a uh, feminine adjective, by the way, because it matches that noun. So pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith, all of that's in the feminine. Instruction, love, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. So um, it, it gives us several options here. It could be the three that describe love. It could be love and the uh, three things. It could be the instruction and love and the three things or some very combination. So I'm glad I helped us out. Here's what I think. I, I think it mainly is focusing in on love and what the, those three things are. Here's why. Because in, in the passages to come, it says these guys want to be teachers. They want to be teachers of the law. And they're assertive about their teaching. They're, they're making confident assertions about things. So they're teaching. They're instructing. They're not lacking instruction. What they're lacking is, is the goal in that instruction, which we have found out is love. The goal is love, but love doesn't sit by itself. 
It's, it's a love that is from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So what are they lacking? What are they neglecting? Love and all the rest of it. Love and everything associated with it. Their goal is more than likely they want to be teachers of the law. Why? There's money in it, folks. For them, not today, goodness. But, but for them, Jewish teachers of the law made bank. It was great. And if they didn't make bank, they got coddled and, 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 and honored because clearly you are a man of God because you know the word. You can, you can do it so well. So why are they in it? That's why they're in it. It's not about love. It's not about God. It's not about faith and a good conscience and pointing you to Christ because there's no money in that. But God's glory's in that. If I'm pointing you to Christ, God's glory is in that. And for a person who loves Christ, that's what they want. That's what they want. So that's the these things. I think it's love and everything attached to it. I think that's what he's mainly drilling in on. So for some men, straying from these things have turned aside to, and it's literally worthless words, worthless words, fruitless discussion. Let's talk about this. Why? 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 Why do you want to talk about that? Oh, well, because, because it makes me a teacher of the law, and maybe you'll give me some money. Maybe you'll give me some accolades. So why do you be teachers of the law, even though they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions? Just because somebody is so sure and dogmatic about something doesn't make them right. Truth is centered on one person. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. That's the center reference truth. How do I know truth? You want to know how you know truth? Him, and then anything he says. Who is he? God. How did he speak? Through his word. This is 100% infallible. This is not. So how are you going to know if this is wrong? By going to this. By the word of God. So let me wrap up with some final thoughts and, and let you go to the wedding, wedding or, or what have you. Here's, here's the deal. This passage is one that God really laid heavy on my heart because I, I don't want us to miss... We're such a great Bible-teaching church, and you know what? We need to stay a great Bible-teaching church. But I don't want us to miss why. I, I, I don't want us to miss that we should have a love for God that beats within our hearts and a love for one another, and that only comes by, by your knowing God by, by coming to him by faith, it's a heart change issue. I can't turn you into a lover. Only God can do that work. And so, so if you sit here this morning and go, I'm not a lover, w would you come to him? Would you come to him this morning? Would you come to this Christ? by faith this morning, even now. Today is the day of salvation. Come. If you do know him and you're going, wow, I struggle in this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. Why are you reading that book? You should read that book. You should read his word. You should be in it. 
You should be in it daily. Why are you in it? Is it to impress your Bible study? Is it to impress your friends? Is it to sound intelligent? Or is it because you love this Jesus so much? You want to know him? You want to show him? And you want to show him to others? And that's the heartbeat for, for you. I pray that that's what it is. That's what it's about for you. That you're not just here listening to some guy talk about some book because it helps me feel better about myself so I can go on my merry way and have a week that has nothing to do with him. I, I pray that, it's, that you truly, deeply, madly love this Jesus. And that's why you're here. And that's why you're in this book. And that's why you love that person that's difficult to love. Or love that family member that's difficult to love because of this Christ. So you may have noticed, possibly, if you've been keeping up with your notes, I gave you kind of five or four main words to help you dial back into this uh, sermon so that you can reflect on it. I gave you location, order, virtue, error. Location, order, virtue, error. L, O, V, E, it's called an acrostic, it's cute. <laughs> um, so love, I, I hope love is gonna help you remember this section of scripture and that you'll remember how it's formulated and, and, and that it'll bring you back to why, why this matters. Get in this word, but challenge your heart to why am I in this word? So I'll wrap up with this. An unknown author submitted a poem to a media outlet. It said, last night my little boy confessed to me some childish wrong and kneeling at my knee, he prayed with tears, dear God, make me a man like daddy, wise and strong, I know you can. Then while he slept, I knelt beside his bed, confessed my sins and prayed with low bowed head. Oh God, make me a child like my son here, pure in gladness, trusting thee with faith sincere. Let's pray. God, it is all because of you that we are here this morning and have this opportunity to be in your word. I pray that everything that was said would be unto your glory, that your name is held high. May we be a people of your word that don't miss the point of your word, that it would continue to conform us into the image of your son as you have promised, you began a good work, and it is you who will be faithful to complete it. So we, we ask by your spirit and through your word that you would to continue to use it to mold our hearts into God, Christ lovers, and Christ worshipers, and Christ honors. And that we would go to the world and preach this Christ in word as well as indeed. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ and for the salvation that is found in him and the, the fruits that are found in his spirit. It is in your name, precious Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. <laughs>